I'm here today because I feel that pernicious anemia is something that's being ignored. People that can't afford to have the B12 injections really are suffering. They're dying, as you rightly said. And basically, it's something that saves lives. And it's very important that people do get their B12 injections. And I want to know today, whilst people are not being given this opportunity unless they go and pay for it privately. You have to look at the root of the word, pernicious, which means ruinous, destructive and fatal. And certainly 55 years ago, people were dying of it. It's unfortunate that in 2009, people are still dying of pernicious anemia. Indeed, we had one uh, lady from Scotland who died last year of pernicious anemia. That was the cause of death on her death certificate. What's more worrying is the fact that there are serious problems with the symptoms uh, the diagnosis and the treatment of pernicious anemia, which is 50-year-old technology. Um, for three years I've tried to infiltrate the medical professional and I've been banging my head against a brick wall. And uh, it came to a pivotal moment in the early summer when I took a gentleman to lunch who used to be a haematologist and is now a clinical negligence specialist lawyer. And he told me that I would be wasting my time trying to talk to doctors because doctors talk to doctors and doctors listen to doctors. And that perhaps I'd be better employed knocking on the doors of politicians. Um, I'm a registered nurse and I co-authored the book Could It Be B12 with my husband who is a physician. I'm an emergency room nurse for 20 years and I actually have pernicious anemia. I diagnosed myself and I taught my hematologist that I had the B12 deficiency. And so for 20 years I've been very interested in pernicious anemia and vitamin B12 deficiency. And what I've found as a healthcare professional for 25 years is physicians are not screening patients for B12 deficiency. So when, if you're deficient and it goes unrecognized, undiagnosed and untreated, you can become, you can get paresthesias like diabetics, get neuropathy that can become permanent, and it also can cause um, paralysis to your legs. There are cases, malpractice cases in the United States where patients are crippled in wheelchairs or bedridden. Well, I was asked by Martin Hooper, who is the chair of the Pernicious Anemia Society, to actually open the new offices when they were founded in Bridgend. I've known about pernicious anemia and vitamin B12 deficiency for many years and in fact uh, when I was in school when I was 16 I think I was my GP thought that I had pernicious anemia and that I lacked vitamin B12 but was subsequently that was found to be wrong but so I was aware of the the condition so when Martin asked me along I was very interested to see what I could do to help people because it's the big risk is that people don't know what they've got they can't get an accurate diagnosis People are misdiagnosed. Yes, this is what we've found. And their lives are put on hold for a treatment that costs about a penny. Yes, I know. That's so amazing, isn't it? That so we can cheap. absolutely change people's lives at very little cost if we can only get this accurately diagnosed and stop people being wrongly diagnosed as having ME, having depression, having all sorts of conditions including, you know, it's all in your own mind, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> which goes on all the time. Which is a devastating yes. diagnosis for someone it and is. for their self-confidence and for their family. Well, an adjournment debate is a way that a Member of Parliament can draw attention to something he or she believes to be very important. Sometimes the effect will be to have the government look very closely again at its policy, but at the very least, the Minister has to come to Parliament, listen for 15 minutes with the short debates and then reply for 15 minutes. That's a long time mm. uh, for a minister to have to give chapter and verse on a particular policy area. So sometimes if the area, if the policy looks a bit weak, it really does force the department to look closely at whether or not they have to, or really ought to, accommodate the member of parliament who's asking the question. Especially so if that MP gets lots of other MPs to agree and, and quite often where something in a constituency uh, is quite striking to one MP there'll be lots of cases across the country so if that MP makes it clear to all the other colleagues that he or she has a debate on a particular subject they'll get lots of support from other MPs because it will be a nationwide problem and that means that the Minister will have to take it all the more seriously.
This is something we can do something about and something we can do actually that it's estimated could save 20 million a year in wrong medication and misdiagnosis. So let's go for it. A debate like the pernicious anemia debate and the requirement, as the lobby would argue, for uh, an additional eight B12 injections is essentially a demand for additional public resources and that has to be balanced against other demands. It has to be balanced by the Secretary of State for Health in this case because there's a finite amount to spend on drugs. So the Minister will always be weighing up whether there's a strong enough case here to reduce expenditure in another area in order to increase it in this area. Of course it has to take account of the science and if the science has moved on it may well be that the assumptions that the policy is based upon have changed and that may lead to a change in policy. But health policy and drugs policy, if I can put it that way, is almost invariably a case of trying to balance off uh, expenditure against quality of life benefit. Uh, and that's what the Minister will be doing in this case. So it could help. It really depends on how well the argument stacks up against rival arguments for resources.